good afternoon, everyone. Hope you had um, a bit of time for some lunch. Uh, I, I am well. I, I just like to introduce our uh, our speaker for this particular session, Alison McAdam. Um, we have done acknowledgements, and I won't do it again. But it is important to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners on the lands on which we are all meeting um, today and tomorrow. So. Uh, but without further ado, I wanted to introduce you to Alison McAdam, who is a, uh, a PhD candidate and is a lecturer at Deakin University and is obviously a colleague of, of myself, as well as um, uh, Christy Hess, who is, lead, is the lead chief investigator, as Lisa Wallace said earlier, in an ARC uh, investigation into what's going on in the local and rural and regional media. and. Um, of which I'm a, a part as well. And uh, Alison is um, a co the co-convener of the university's rural communication research cluster. Um, she's worked in the news media. Uh, she, uh, as night editor at the Geelong Advertiser, most, most recently she, she continues to do shifts there while working at Deakin and doing her PhD. Um, loafing as always, as, as they say, uh, but she's, no, she's, uh, the title of her talk today is Temporal Reflexivity and the Sustainability of the Baloque Times. And without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Alison. Thank you. Thanks, Matthew. Before I get into it, I'd like to mention that my presentation is just one of three being conducted by members of Deakin's Rural Communication Research Cluster at this conference today. So let me just get my slides up. This paper focuses on local journalism and the news outlets that serve rural and regional areas across Australia. In recent years, the dominant discourse in this field has been one of decline, and that's understandable. The sector has experienced widespread cutbacks, mergers and closures in recent years, and that's even before the coronavirus um, pandemic hit and reportedly forced 200 odd mastheads to either shut or shutter. My research shifts to a different view by exploring the context in which local news is sustainable, is surviving, is thriving even. It focuses on mastheads that are bucking the trend of decline by increasing or maintaining their paying audience. Many of these are long serving newspapers with histories that stretch back 100 years or more. In this paper, I explore the historical and temporal dimensions of local news sustainability arguing there has never been a more important time to look back at the history of newspapers so that we can learn from the past to inform the present. This paper complements my PhD studies, which are part of a broader ARC linkage project titled Media Innovation and the Civic Future of Australia's Country Press. The industry partner in that big project is Country Press Australia. In this presentation, I draw on the history of one masthead under the CPA umbrella, the Bull Oak Times in Victoria's Wimmera, using it as a case study to investigate sustainability through a temporal reflexivity lens. The concept of temporality or our relationship with time has traditionally been thought of as the linear progression from past of past, present and future. Taking this view, it is safe to say that journalism is rooted in the present part of that timeline. It covers the here and now, reports the latest happenings, is a record of the present. Zelizer argues for journalism scholars to also train their focus on time and to put temporality at the foreground of their studies to better understand news. However, she warns against a narrow temporal focus that gets fixated on nowness and also urges journalism scholars to move beyond considering time simply and exclusively as speed. How fast is news produced? How fast is it consumed? She's, she laments that in recent times, speed has become a stand-in for time and describes this practice as a unidimensional approach to the issue of temporality in news. These discussions suggest that there is a need for a more nuanced approach that takes full advantage of multiple temporalities that allows researchers to not just look at the here and now, but to also look forward, sideways and backwards. Carlson and Lewis suggest, uh, uh, sorry, Carlson and Lewis have taken up this call by suggesting a temporal reflexivity lens for journalism studies. This approach emphasizes and elevates exploration of the past 
and suggests that history could hold answers to present questions. At its core, temporal reflexivity allows scholars to draw on lessons of the past to adapt to changes in the present and future. Importantly, for a study such as mine that investigates sustainability, a temporal reflexivity lens provides a focus that, that differs from the current academic inclination to research what is changing, new, different and innovative in journalism's push for survival, and instead pay attention to what isn't changing. This should help reveal what is enduring and what has stood the test of time amid the changing landscape of local journalism. In this sense, these scholars are warning those studying journalism to not become ahistoric, indifferent to tradition and without concern for the past, as they argue there is much to be learned from looking back. Matthews and Hodgson would agree that this is especially true for local journalism, where they suggest there are many lessons that can be learned from history. They argue that we need to bring thinking through history to the contemporary predicament facing the local and regional newspaper. A look back through history, they say, will show that, in the UK at least, a discourse of decline has hung over the local press for almost a century, that newspapers have long faced challenges, but they have found ways to survive. This mirrors the history of Australia's local newspaper industry too, where a struggle for survival and the overcoming of challenges has been present from the very beginning. As historian Rod Kirkpatrick points out, the beginnings of Australia's newspaper industry were not much more than a scramble littered with failures. In the second half of the 1800s, there were plenty of newspapers that only lasted a few years or even a few months. But he found of those newspapers that did survive, many went on to serve their communities for very long periods of time, decades or more. They did this, he argues, through persistence and commitment they rose to the challenges of competition from a new masthead in the region by increasing their frequency, the frequency of their publication, enlarging it or upgrading their printing equipment. And they provided a consistent voice to their communities via long serving editors or pr proprietors. Through a temporal reflexivity lens, these are lessons from history that could inform local journalism's present and aid its survival. The distant past could be a good place to mine for answers to journalism's future. With that in mind, I've been looking at the histories of mastheads that have been bucking the trend of decline in local news by actually increasing their paying audience. My research has found that, according to audited circulation and digital subscription data, there are five mastheads under the Country Press Australia banner that managed to increase or maintain their paying audience between 2016 and the end of 2020. The mastheads in this sample are listed here on the left. If we consider this economic measure a gauge of sustainability, then how do we understand the historical and temporal dimensions at play here? By applying a temporal reflexivity lens, we find that while the Monaro Post is only 15 years old, the other mastheads in this list have much longer histories of serving their communities, with most being 100 or more years old. For this presentation, I will focus on the oldest of these, the Bull Oak Times, based in the Victorian town of Donald. I'll explore what aspects of this long-serving local masthead have been preserved over time and what relationship these aspects might have to the sustainability of this local news outlet. The Bullock Times was founded as the Donald Times in 1875 by Godfrey Morgan, who ran the paper until his death in 1891. His wife, Mary, stepped in then to take over. And for the next 30 odd years, while her sons grew, came and went, and the First World War raged, Mary was the constant, the steady hand at the helm. In 1919, one of her sons, William, bought the paper and he called on his nephew, Godfrey Letts, to join the business as editor. This Godfrey, who was known as Goff, buys the paper from his uncle in 1924 and serves as editor for a remarkable 66 years. Goff writes his last editorial from his hospital bed and dies in 1987. Goff's son, Robin, is the current editor. He's been working at the paper since 1970 and is now 91 years old. 
His son is David and David is a current co-owner. David is the great, great grandson of the founder Godfrey Morgan. This family dynasty is overseen, has overseen mergers and name changes, but they have found a way to continue to serve their community. And they are now not just surviving, they are increasing their paying audience as well. It's a remarkable feat in, a current, in the current climate. Why and how are they doing this? While it's tempting to just look at the changes they have made and how they have adapted to new technologies, adopting a temporal reflexivity lens allows me to also look at what they have preserved from their long past. What content or ethos, work practices or connections have they maintained, have stood the test of time and still work as well now as they did decades before. To research this, I've been analysing historic editions of the Bullock Times dating from 1915 to 1918. I found several factors that have carried through the ages and we'll outline them here in this presentation. These are things that could be worthy of further exploration in terms of their possible effect on this paper's current sustainability. The first of these is the fact the newspaper is still printed on site today, just as it was 146 years ago. Keeping all levels of the production in-house is counter to the wave of centralization that has washed over local news sector in the past 20 years or so. In some instances, this shift has seen local newspaper offices that once occupied the main street shut and sold. In other instances, centralization has seen parts of the production process, such as sub-editing, layout and printing, moved out of the local area to central hubs in metropolitan cities. According to Bowd or Bode, according to Bode, outsourcing such as this can have a negative impact on a paper's perceived localness in the eyes of readers. But this is something the Bull Oak Times does not need to worry about. It is local to the core. It is produced from start to finish on site in an old building just off the town's main street. Retaining the in-house press could also be contributing to the masthead's sustainability on a financial level. The Bull Oak Times still provides a printing service to the community, something it's done since 1875. This provides a secondary income stream to the business, one that's been long lost to papers that have had to centralise. The paper is still published bi-weekly too, just as it was 100 years ago. Every Tuesday and every Friday, there is a new edition of the Bull Oak Times available in print form and as a digital newspaper online. It's a consistency that could be helping readers from form a habit of buying and consuming the product. If habits are learned slowly over time through repetition, as marketing scholar Martin Neal says, then the Bull Oak Times has done its best to perpetuate reader habit by delivering a consistent rhythm of news on the same days, twice a week, for more than a century. Promoting staff and bringing them in as partners in the business has been something generations of the Letts family have done. When Goff bought the paper in 1924 from his uncle, he did so in a partnership with the paper's then foreman, Charles Chessels. This partnership lasted 52 years until 1970 when Chessels suffered a serious illness. The replacement partnership comprised Goff, two family members and two workers who had been each been at the paper for more than a decade. Today, the co-owner is Shane O'Shea, who started at the paper as a compositor's apprentice in 1972. This level of staff loyalty and continuity in leadership, scholars say, can result in a steady, reliable product, one its readers can come to know and trust. These readers have not had to watch their local paper be overhauled by a new own outside owner or radically changed by a new editor. The same hands have been writing the stories, setting the editorial direction and liaising with readers and advertisers for decades. Everyone knows what to expect. This aligns with Kirkpatrick's suggestion that providing a consistent voice through long serving staff and proprietors can aid survival. Consistency and longevity in leadership and staff also gives these people time to learn about the community and their audience get a sense of what the audience wants to know and what they need to know. This deep end of understanding was evident when ABC Radio interviewed the editor Robin during the 2013 federal election. 
When asked about his reasons for virtually ignoring the federal election in the pages of the paper, Robin said the goings on in Canberra sort of seem almost remote to, remote to people in Donald. He knew that his customers, the people buying his paper, the people in his community were interested in matters closer to home. And when that came to politics, that meant local government. He said, if we can help it, we never miss a council meeting because we decided long ago that it's the closest thing to our local parliament and local issues are the big thing. Local council reporting has been a consistent throughout the paper's local his uh, long history, but other content has also endured. Perhaps not surprisingly, things such as an editorial on page two, death notices and weather reports. But also, maybe more interestingly, we see the paper help residents deal with the latest technology then and now. 100 years ago, that was listing subscribers to the local telephone exchange and each household's new two digit phone number. Today, residents are using the paper to tell the community of their new phone number after the NBN has rolled out. This hyperlocal content indicates a confidence to follow their own path, to resist media trends and sometimes national happenings, and instead maintain a single minded push to keep it local. They appear to be doing their own thing at the Bullock Times based on decades of knowledge of their area and their readers. How do we know if this tactic is working though in terms of sustainability? Well, further research would flesh this out more, but data shows more people are paying for the content produced by the Bullock Times now than they were five years ago. The Masthead's paying audience across its print and digital platforms has increased by 4.46% since 2016. In the same time frame, for comparison, other papers in Western Victoria, such as the Northwest Express in Oyen, saw its paying audience fall by almost 20%, and the Hamilton Spectator's paying audience dropped more than 41%. In 2019, Robin told the Weekly Times his newspaper was committed to the community and that newspapers have a big part to play to get the local news out. It's a message the paper has been spruiking for more than 100 years. In a 1918 edition, when it was called the Donald Times, an ad told readers the paper's aim was to promote the welfare of the community as a whole. The Donald Times has consistently and at all times dealt trenchantly with the requirements of the district. Do not forget that a live newspaper is a valuable asset to the community. It might not be quite so overt in its self-promotion these days, but the Bullock Times does still run own ads in its pages. In an addition just this month on September 14, there was a full page ad in the paper for the paper's printing and publishing services. It's a great way to advertise your products to potential customers right across the Eastern Wimmera, the ad said. The degree to which self-promotion contributes to local news sustainability perhaps requires a bit more uh, research, but it does appear to aid the mastheads standing in the community. The Bull Oak Times and the Letts Family Association with it has become somewhat of a symbol of the town. A new book titled The Wimmera features 65 towns in that region of Western Victoria, capturing the essence of each location with a photo and a story about someone or something that sums up each town. In Donald, that um, they show Robin, his son David, and the co-owner Shane at the printing press. It is the only newspaper to feature in the book. It's a powerful indication of how the paper and the town are intertwined, have come to be thought of as interchangeable. Now the passage of time could be a factor here, but the paper itself has been helping to create that stature since the early 1900s by simply telling readers of its own importance. The Donald community and its newspaper appear to ha long have had an interdependency and Robin indicated as much in, in 2019. He stressed then that the paper published content locals could not get anywhere else, but it relied on the community to provide that content. He said, whether it's a CWA or cricket, we depend on the people of this town to tell us what's happening and we do our best to get all that in the paper for them. To this end, these days, the Bullock Times 
website has a submit a story button that encourages readers to contribute content and ideas online. This reliance on each other was evident in the 100 year old papers I analysed too. In 1918, the newspaper was making regular call outs for residents to submit letters from loved ones who were fighting on the front far away in the First World War. And summing up in applying a temporal reflexivity lens to this one case study site has helped me to reveal some elements of the past that are still in use today. While there has been some innovation and adaption at this masthead, there's also been much from history that has been preserved. They have not been afraid to maintain the status quo in some areas of content, production and business. While this study has revealed those things, further research is needed to investigate the extent of the impact these elements might be having on the sustainability of this and other country, news, uh, country mastheads. I'll be continuing to explore the historic and temporal dimensions of sustainability as part of my PhD study, which now includes fieldwork at the Bull Oak Times and other country press Australia mastheads that are bucking the trend of decline. Thank you for listening. That's great. Thank you, Alison. Thank you for that. That was really, really interesting and very well presented. So, but if anyone has any questions, uh, either just come onto the call, given let's not um, stand on ceremony here. If you've got a question for Alison, just unmute yourself uh, and, um, and fire away. Um. I'll jump in seeing that everyone's sure, still sure. muted. Thank you. Hey, Alison. Hey, Marco. Yeah, that was yeah, that was a really interesting. It was really good. Um, so it seemed like the only thing they did differently was that they had that generation of um, news owners, because yeah, all those other um, factors that the that they said kept them going. You do see them in other local newspapers, don't you? It's true. And yeah. I, think I, will, I think I will find that. Um, I, I think I'd find that if I was looking at the, well, I'm, I'm yet to look at the other ones that are in the, the list of five. Um, but you're right. Some of those things I'm sure other newspapers are doing and they might not be increasing their paying audience. So as I sort of said, there's some things there that, clearly have been preserved from the past that we need to look at and see if the, what sort of impact they're having on sustainability. Um, but maybe there's other factors at play as well. This might yeah. be just part of the context of lo how local news can be sustainable. And you said that they, were, that they gave promotions as well? Mm. Yeah. yeah, well, lots of the time the, the staff stay there for a long time, which... Yeah. You know, That's I just don't pretty know different, if, isn't it? might be yes yeah. yep um and they bring them in as partners in the business too so that makes them invest well i'm guessing that's makes them invested in the product too it seemed mm. to be something that they've done for well since 1924 and <laughs> they've been bringing in workers to um yeah as partners yeah interesting yeah that, that is i've never heard of that before, so. mm. yeah great thanks for that marco um who else has a question? I've got um, one. Hey there, Mark. I was just, g'day, Alison. Thanks for that. That was good and actually quite helpful for my own research as well. I was wondering um, when you spoke about the fact that they didn't cover the federal election, and I also wondered so, would they not have been a subscriber to AAP and would stories from other you know, uh, other parts of the country, would that not have factored into their content either? Was that, have they just purely been local? And I also wonder whether smaller is better. This even, you know, we're talking much, much smaller. I wonder if that worked as well. Mm. As far as I can tell, they don't use any um, wire content from AAP or Reuters or anything like that. Um, and as far as I can tell as well, the, just from looking at recent editions online, well, the, the new actual newspaper is online, so that's handy. Um, that yeah, they don't they um, don't pick up stories from other other places. It really is local content. They might have the premier's um, 
pandemic announcement will be fairly word for word plonked in the paper. So they'll be using press releases and things like that, but they don't tend to pick up stories from elsewhere or that have been mm. written anywhere else. And they are definitely small. They they haven't thought to, or as far they, they haven't branched out, they haven't gobbled up other newspapers in the, in, yeah. you know, and they don't have multiple mastheads under their umbrella. It's the one masthead. Which, you know, maybe that makes it more manageable for them. And it's in Birchip or? It's in both. It's based in Donald, but they have an office in Birchip as well. An office in Birchip, right. Yeah. So in the long distant past, there was a Birchip paper and it was called the Donald Times and they've merged and they've become the Bull Oak Times to match the shire, the name of the shire. Uh. Okay, so Lucy had a question. Sorry, I'll turn my video on too. Um, sure. Alison, that was really interesting um, from my own point of view, that photo of them standing with their, um, I believe it is a Hobson horizontal slap bed collator. I have one at my print office in Gilgandra and I thought it was the only one in the universe, so I was so happy to see that photo. <laughs> um, it looked like they had a Heidelberg um, MO in the back there. So we're probably like sisters from another mother, our little <laughs> printer in Gilgandra, very similar business model. Um, and up until last year, yeah, no expansion, just totally hyper-local. Um, and going back to Mark's question about not really including political news. We just did a recent survey and it was very smallly um, responded to locally, but political news was one of the things that they just went, nah, we don't really want to know about political news, not of interest to us. Um, they want to see more sports, schools, local, you know, yeah, by all means go and attack the local council. That was quite popular, but yeah, uh, broader political news, they're not really interested in. I, and I guess that's because you get that 24 hours a day from the television or from your metro papers or your radio and, and ABC and those sorts of things. So that's what we find in Gilgandra. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that um, it's the same in Donald. You know, like you, can, like you say, people in Gilgandra can get the, um, you know, the, the national news and statewide news on television or whatever, but they can't get their local news anywhere else. So they're looking to you for that local news. They don't need it. They don't need you to be telling them what, Scott Morrison's doing in France or not doing with France. I also had a question. Yes, yeah, exactly. And sorry, sorry. Bernadette. No, yeah, no, we're finished, probably the last one. Sorry, sorry. Thank, thanks for that, Lucy. And, and Bernadette, one last one. Yeah, um, sorry, sorry, Lucy. I think I'm cutting off. We've got a delay between our country areas. I suspect. <laughs> um, uh, thanks, Alison. I really love that insight into what you're doing. I was curious when you had the split between digital and print, um, whether they are providing an online version and whether that's attracting much of an audience. And there might not be time to get to this as well, but the whole hatches, matches and dispatches, whether or not they're still incorporating that because that's been, you know, I think we think that people went to papers for news, but often they went for all of the other stuff, which local still does so well and I just I was curious whether or not that's still a paid element and they're getting anything out of classifieds when so much of that now is just posted on Facebook or bypassing um, the media. Hmm. Yeah definitely they've definitely got there's plenty of birth notices, um, death notices. I, to be honest I haven't seen a lot of wedding announcements you know the wedding photos or anything but the yeah the public notices are still big still there which is great. Um, and you mentioned about the website that the, they have a website, like a, a news website that has, um, you know, a normal looking website where you click on stories, but they also, and I love this, uh, they also have um, the actual paper where you can put, flick through the pages online, which is very, very handy for researchers like us, but um, it actually helps you see more of the paper. You don't online. You don't see all those little the note the public notices and things. So I think people are probably lapping up that that um, that physical paper. Well, the physical paper virtually, <laughs> if you can put it that way. But yeah, you mentioned too that they're um, they're they're paying audience. The the I think was it, it is going up online. So you can split print sales and digital subscriptions and their digital subscriptions are going up, which, which is helping their overall paying audience go up for sure. Okay, great. 
Okay, well, um, thank you for that, that, all those questions. And I'm just putting a little uh, applause uh, <laughs> emoticon up there to thank Alison for her terrific presentation and for the really good engagement from everyone. So we are a little bit over time, but I, that's a sign sometimes of a good session. So thank you, Alison. Thanks to everyone. And um, see you in the next session. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for asking questions.